Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we're thankful again for the privilege, the opportunity to fellowship together in the study of your word. May the Holy Spirit take this hour and minister truth to our hearts, stripping away that which is foolish, that which is carnal, that which is ignorant, but opening our eyes to that which you have revealed in your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We have been studying together in the epistle to Philemon, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were at verse 16. Philemon. 16. There's only one chapter in the epistle. You'll remember the story of Philemon. The historical fact is that a man named Philemon had a slave named Onesimus who fled from him. As I pointed out, an heiress passive, he was made to, to depart. Whether or not he stole from him, we're, we're not certain. We do have uh, two first-class conditions that most people believe indicates that Onesimus defrauded his master and he used those funds to flee from Rome to Colossae. At Rome, the Lord led him to the presence of Paul and it was there that he heard the grand message of what Christ had done for him, that Christ had died for him and that he was one of God's children, one of God's elect, and now he's being sent back to his master, Philemon. He was under a death sentence, he, uh, Onesimus was, uh, and Philemon could do with him as he chose, and we know that, uh, we know from history that slaves were treated worse than animals, and that most slaves who defrauded their masters or ran away were put to death. Uh, Roman law said that if a slave killed his master, then that was worse than anything else that he could do. And so the law said every slave in the household had to be killed in that case. And one of the slaves, uh, a gentleman that named uh, Padanius Secundus, uh, killed his master. For what reason, I don't know, but there were 400 slaves in that household and they were all put to death. Well, that was, that was Onesimus' anticipation. And now, not only is he going back to Philemon, we have every reason to believe that Paul dictated this letter and uh, Onesimus wrote it. And so he knows what's in the letter and he's carrying it back to his master, Philemon. Now, I believe those to be historical facts, but they really happened. Our God is the God of history but I believe that the author of this epistle, as well as all the rest of the word, is the Holy Spirit. I believe the Apostle Paul was used as the tool to dictate it. Onesimus probably wrote it, but the Holy Spirit is the author. And what we're looking at here is what the Holy Spirit has to say in a message to God's people. If the only truth in this epistle is for Onesimus and there's no lesson for us, then there's no really, well, there's no reason for the Holy Spirit to even include it in the Word of God. We saw uh, in our last study how it was God who directed in verse 15, That he departed, he was made to depart. That's an aorist passive. God 
caused Onesimus to depart. He was made to depart uh, for an hour, my Bible says, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season. You could easily uh, translate that. For probably he was made to leave for a moment in order that you would receive him back forever, for eternity. And the word translated season in my Bible is the Greek word for hour, uh, H-O-U-R, hour. It's our word for a period of time. In fact, uh, normally we could translate it a short period of time, but when he comes back, he's no longer back as a servant, but now he's back as a brother, as a member of God's family, as a member of God's household. He is back as one who is loved, who's dearly beloved. And so we come to verse 17. If thou count me, therefore a partner, receive him as myself, and it's a first class condition, since you count me in fellowship, receive him as myself. Very succinct statement. Uh, very few words, but fraught with meaning. I have uh, tried the best I know how uh, to point out to you folks the devastation of the law. Every time you brought a sacrifice, uh, you must have been impressed with the, the, the fact that, well, you'll be doing this again. You know, this sacrifice is not sufficient. In the Old Testament, when you sinned, you brought a sacrifice, and that sacrifice was sufficient for that sin. But when you sinned again, well, you had to bring another one. And when you sinned again, you had to bring another one. And when the, 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 the priest went into the holiest of holies once a year to make sacrifice for the sins of the people, you knew full well that he'd be doing it next year. And many Christians think that Christ only died for the sins that we committed up until we accepted Christ when the truth is that when Christ died, he died for all of our sin. The problem with the law is it did not take away sin. It was, it was simply in the words of the Old Testament, an atonement. Atonement, dearly beloved, is not a New Testament word. The word means a covering. The sacrifice was simply a testimony of that which was to come, but more sin came and more covering was needed until Christ died. And over and over again, the Holy Spirit makes it very clear that in that he died, he died on the sin once. So how is it then that, that we're going to make a sacrifice that doesn't need to be repeated for all of the sacrifices of the law were repeated. And I, I repeat that the devastation of the law must have been on the mind of the human. You know, I, I have to do it again. And I have to do it again. If the sacrifice only covered the sins until that moment, what happened a second or two, you know, two seconds later when sin once again was there. We are, uh, we are told in Romans 5 and 2, uh, oh no, Romans 5 and 2 Corinthians 5, that God made us righteous. That's what happened when Christ died unto sin once and only once. And in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. To, to put it in terms of in the terms of your Bible, he who knew no sin was made to be sin for us 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so a sacrifice was made that was not only sufficient for all sin, but a sacrifice which in, in fact made us righteous so that God can now declare that we are not under law, but under grace, under grace. And it amazes me at how the word grace is thrown around today. I'm not sure what most Christians mean by grace, but somehow or other, they always insert at least some level of merit in their understanding of grace. And dearly beloved, grace is totally, absolutely, absolutely devoid of merit. Not based on merit. It is not reward. It is grace. And God, by his grace, made us righteous. As by the disobedience of the one, the many were made sinners in exactly the same way by the obedience of the one, the many were made righteous. Now the law wasn't made for a righteous man. That's who you are. And in God making them righteous, they became, well, they, they always were his people, but now they are totally his people with no separation, no break, no possibility of ever being forsaken. They're his people. You know, it's a tremendous study to go through the scriptures and look at uh, that phrase, my people. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. It doesn't say for the transgression of everyone. It's not what it says. But for the transgression of my people was he, Christ, stricken. He died in my place. He did not die for me in the sense that there was some possibility there. But in fact, he took my place. He died in my place, a substitutionary death, in my place. And so he took my sin, and I became what he was, righteous. Surely the Holy Spirit expects us to grasp the realization that when Christ died in our place, we are so intimately connected to Christ that we are made righteous. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God was never satisfied with the sacrifices. There was never complete satisfaction made only a covering made over and over again. It's like it snows, pure white, gets dirty, it snows again, gets more dirt on it, and you know, it's, so it's layered like, like that. I, folks, we, we see in Hebrews, the priest stands daily making sacrifice for sin, but Christ offered himself once for all. God declared that he would not say someone was righteous unless they were righteous. And so in order to do that, he made us righteous. He made us righteous. He declared us righteous. Now, going back to Philemon, since you count me therefore in fellowship with you, receive him as myself. And I've, I've tried to get you, you folks to try to look at this through spiritual eyes. And in, in the media, mediatory tory work that we see of, of the incarnate Christ before the right hand of God, receive him as myself. You are made as righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the sacrifice made for sin that is eternal, never to be repeated. In any, any theology, any position, that you may take before God Almighty that would suggest something more needs to be done to settle the sin question. 
blasphemes the finished work of Jesus Christ. I, I can't, I've just got to say it. What more could God possibly say than to say that he made you righteous? Receive him. Okay, the text. Our text says, and we have been accepted in the beloved. If he owes you anything, put that on my account. Are, are you getting this? Our sin was placed on Christ to settle a debt that we could never pay, and we are complete in him. Complete in him. In Colossians, we read, and ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. If you are complete in him, folks, what is left to be done? If you have been made righteous, what more needs to be done? God works in our lives patiently like he did in the life of Onesimus. For us to come to realize that we have been made righteous in Christ, that we were brought back to our master. The, the Christian community spends its time urging you somehow or another to get busy and to make yourselves righteous when you in fact already are. And until you understand that, until you understand that, you cannot know the peace that passes understanding. You can't or, or enter into the joy that's unspeakable. You are hid with Christ in God. Receive him as myself. Christ can say that because you've been made as righteous as he. In order for us to, to pray that if it be thy will, we have to realize that that's the will of Christ. And only in the new creation do we recognize our position in Christ. I'm talking about positional truth here. The works of the flesh are manifest and, and they always are. They don't do anything else. And folks, for you to spend time trying to make the flesh acceptable to God, trying to make the flesh do what it cannot do is a futile effort and it leads to discouragement. It leads to despondency that takes away the joy, takes away the peace, takes away the rest that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Since that's a first class condition, verse 17, since we're in fellowship. Oh, oh listen, Christ rose from the dead. My, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in a, in a short sentence, the Holy Spirit, I believe, reveals to us that we can't possibly enter into the horror of the price paid that Christ paid for sin. Bear in mind, it cost you nothing, but it, it cost Christ everything. We were with him in his death, identified with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. We were buried with him. We, we died with him. We were buried with him. We rose with him to what? To walk in newness of life, his life, his life, not ours, his life. We need to realize the import of what really took place at that moment in human history when Christ hung on the cross. Dearly beloved, listen, generations of Jews practicing sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, and yet Christians, us Christ ones today, we lack the confidence that the sacrificial lamb of God himself did enough. Why are we celebrating Easter? Why do we celebrate Easter? Why? Because Christ rising from the dead was the step of God's approval that he is satisfied. The sin question is settled once for all. No longer is sin a question in your life. 
You've been made righteous. He rose from the dead and he's now seated at the right hand of God. Exercising the authority and, and the power of the deity. There is fellowship. There's fellowship. And the first portion of this verse says that the price, Christ, the price that Christ paid is a sufficient price. He rose from the dead so that God is satisfied with the payment made. The last part of the verse says, you have been made righteous. Receive him as myself. When you stand before God, as you stand before God, you stand there in Christ. No wonder the scriptures can declare, who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that rose again. What is the, why does the Holy Spirit say that? Because the death isn't sufficient if he didn't rise. But if he rose from the dead, the price that he paid is enough. Something that the animal sacrifice did not do, that, that could not do, for the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, seeing that they never cease to be offered. But Christ died once and only once for sin and now being made the righteousness of God, the mediator can say, receive him as myself. Dearly beloved, when God looks at you, he looks at you through Christ. When he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of God the Lord Jesus Christ that has been imputed unto you. It still seems common in Christian circles to suggest that when you sin, an entrance is made into your account and, and, then, and then Christ wiped it clean. Oh, he did so much more than that. He deposited so much in your account, you couldn't possibly spend it up. Having been made righteous, there is no need for more sacrifice. Adam was innocent, but Adam was not righteous. Righteous people, folks, do not sin. Now, the Christian mind seems totally confused on this subject. No, I still sin, Steve. Pastor Steve, I still sin. I, I, says somebody. Yeah, your old man sins, but that which has been made righteous doesn't. It does not sin. It doesn't have the power to sin. It doesn't have the ability to sin. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed abideth in him, and he has no power to sin. The old man, that's all he does. He sins all the time. But when Christ made you righteous, he didn't make the old man righteous. He made you righteous. You are a new creation in Christ. The Bible speaks of an old man and a new man. Some refer to that. So some, you'll hear people say new man. New nature, old nature, I prefer what the Bible says. In Ephesians, we are told that you have put off the old man with his deeds and you have put on the new man. Most Christians I talk to seem to think that that's the, well, that's the clothes closet in Ephesians and that, you know, you're always changing clothes. You know, you put on the old and then you put on the new. And then you put on the old. And then you put on the new. Even if you take it that way, and I, I don't believe that's what it is. I believe it is a statement of fact in the Word of God that you have put off the old man and you have put on the new so that Christ can declare 
receive him as my son. Receive what? The old man? No. <clears throat> the natural man cannot please God. He cannot be subject to the law of God. He cannot cease sinning. He can't, he can't stop sinning. But the new man, he's made righteous. Receive him as myself. How are we receiving one another, folks? The next verse says, and it's a first class condition, since if he's wronged you and he has, since he hath wronged thee or owes you and he does, put that on my account. Wow. Uh, I mean, come on, folks. I, we don't have to look very far to see what's going on. As far as I know, no Greek scholar ever questioned the, the power of that first class condition. Onesimus did wrong Philemon. He did. And Onesimus does owe Philemon something that he can't repay. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that Onesimus stole from him. And I, I'm not unwilling to say that I believe absolutely, without a doubt, Onesimus took money or defrauded his master, Philemon. I don't know. But if he, if he did nothing but leave his master, his master is now defrauded of his service. I'm sure Onesimus, just by leaving, robbed Philemon of his services. Now, if that's what's involved in the verse, okay, I, I don't know. I happen to think it's more than that. He did more than just run away. And the argument of verse 18 is not that, well, maybe he didn't do this, or, you know, please excuse him for what he did. Will you know it? Folks, will you know that there is no effort whatsoever to rationalize what Onesimus did? There's nothing in this verse to say that Onesimus is innocent. And of course, that's the position of the sinner before God. Every mouth is stopped. I had no argument with God, and, and no one else will. Onesimus he knew he was guilty before God. But oh, there's a much greater message here. <clears throat> there is no doubt that every one of us have sinned against God. There's no claim for merit in the verse. Where in verse 18, where in verse 18 is Paul suggesting there's something good in Onesimus? Well, Philemon, he really didn't do too bad. I mean, come on, come on, Philemon. Other slaves have run away. And, and oh, Onesimus, he's spoken so well of you. You know, I've had several conversations with him. And, and, and Philemon, he said that, you know, you know, you're a pretty nice guy after all. And, you know, and he's really sorry that he, he ran away. Folks, there's none of that. No excuse for sin. This man is guilty. Sin is sin. There aren't little sins, big sins, and, you know, kind of you know, those in between, you know. But only in your mind and, and only in the laws of the land. The sinner sins because he's a sinner. And sinners sin, but those who are made righteous cannot sin. And there's no question of human merit in the verse. There is no merit. We've been made righteous by the merit of Christ and not our own. Put it on my account. Every possible guilt has been placed on Jesus Christ. Oh, what a marvelous fact. To know that we are his and his forever. 